Hi everybody, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Bengt Andersson and I work at the uh, Nordic Welfare Center as a senior advisor in the area of welfare technology. Uh, and uh, this is our first webinar from in our network, uh, Nordic Research Network, Health and Welfare Technology. Uh, how to impl implement uh, welfare technology. That's what we're going to talk about today. And this is our program. Uh, we will have, uh, uh, now I'm making, saying welcome to you. And uh, then we go on, me and Helene Melkas, we talk a little about what we're doing in this network. Uh, I will also introduce the launch of uh, our new website. And then uh, 20 plus one, uh, we'll, uh, we, um, Victoria Sander, do a presentation of implementation of welfare te technology, the systematic review of barriers and uh, facilitators. Uh, and after that, we will have a discussions with uh, Laila Öxneberg, uh, Gunhilde Rotvold, uh, Helena Melkas, and that is led of Kristin Gustafsson. And around half past two, we will uh, close uh, the webinar. Uh, but first of all, a little bit about this network. Uh, the aim of the research is to, con to consolidate knowledge, research, higher education and experiences in the field of health and welfare technology with the user perspective. This initiative started uh, in 2019 and it was Christine Gustafsson, associate professor at the uh, uh, Mellanon University that contacted us at the Nordic Welfare Center to see if we could do something about it. Uh, there are in fact a lot of publications and research going on in this area. Uh, the welfare technology area. Uh, so we started up to see if could we put up, uh, put up a, a network. And uh, uh, the, the goal of the network is to increase knowledge, uh, research, higher education and practical findings in health and welfare technology. Uh, you globally, the medical care and the social care sectors are both facing major changes and digitalization and technology play an even greater role in various types of welfare services. At the same time, it is important to develop patient and client focuses processes that enable people to live independently for, for longer. And healthcare and welfare technology may also become significant, significant in the fields of disability and pedagogics. So you can go in and read more about this, uh, this website, uh, this, the network's public website on this uh, website address as you see, see here. Uh, this, this is the website uh, that we have and where you can go in and read, uh, read, read uh, of what we're, we're aiming at. Uh, the responsibility, we have formalized this, this network during 2020 and uh, the responsibility uh, of the network's ongoing work is yearly followed by the chairmanship of the Nordic Council of Ministers. Uh, and during 2021, it is Finland that is, uh, has the chairmanship of the Nordic Council of Ministers. So therefore, they always also Finland uh, that are responsible, responsible together with us at the Nordic Welfare Center to organize the work uh, uh, and to do these different activities that we have planned for and go, that's going on. But one of the activities is this uh, seminar and webinar that we have today. today. And I would like to welcome in uh, Helene uh, Melkas, professor at Lahti University of Technology Finland uh, here and, and say some, some word, please. Please Hel Helene, uh, I give the word to you. Uh, you can present yourself and then go on with, with, with the activities. Yes, thank you very much, Bent. And uh, hello everyone. So, um, I'm Helena Melkas from Lut University in Finland. I'm a professor of service innovations in the Department of Industrial Engineering and Management. And I'm uh, fortunate to have as my co-chair for this year, uh, Anna Forsman from uh, Obo Academy in Vasa. Um, I have a long background in the research uh, on the use of welfare technology, uh, about 20 years have passed in this field. And um, I have done research on various solutions in various uh, services and also at different levels of the society. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I will tell you just very briefly about this uh, research network's uh, planned activities for this year. Um, we, Bent is actually going to tell you more about this web page for the members very soon. Um, we will arrange other webinars this year, two altogether, four, two now in the spring and then two in the autumn. We will also prepare a research proposal together. That's also uh, something that we have been already doing and um, that's obviously an important opportunity for a network to, um, to um, create new partnerships and new uh, combinations of uh, research fields, for instance. We will also participate in various events arranged by the Nordic Council of Ministers uh, during this uh, Finnish presidency. Um, we are planning to have a network meeting um, at the end of this year, and we will participate in various um, uh, national and international conferences as well. Um, then I would like, like to say just a few words more about this one project that is currently ongoing. So um, uh, next slide, please. This is one example of the activities this year and also next year. And um, uh, so we have received funding from this uh, joint committee for Nordic Research Councils in the Humanities and Social Sciences uh, via Academy of Finland. And we have funding to arrange a workshop series to synthesize and advance Nordic research-based knowledge of, on proactive health and welfare technology. We approach this uh, topic at different levels. So we uh, focus on the nature and nature of the needs for a proactive health and welfare technology use um, from the point of view of older clients or patients, people with disabilities, and also their informal caregivers. Secondly, we focus on the implementation uh, from the perspective of professional caregivers. And then finally, in the third workshop, we focus on the societal level in the expected future implementation of such proactive health and welfare technology. And this word proactive is very important. It's in the title of the project. And we can see that in many cases, health and welfare technologies is perhaps brought into use um, by the end users too late. So this kind of proactive um, approach is what we wish to advance. So again, this is one example of our activities and we will be providing further information um, as it proceeds. Uh, welcome to this webinar once again, and um, I will now hand over to Bent. Thank you. Yes. And uh, I will now give uh, the word to uh, Victoria Sander, who will start up uh, uh, her presentation. There you are, Victoria. Yes, here I am. Yeah. And you hey. start up and sharing your presentation. Very good. Then I will uh, turn off my video and my uh, microphone, and I will give the word to you, uh, Victoria. The word is yours. Thank you very much, Bengt. So I will present to you the findings from research about barriers and facil facilitators that affect implementation of welfare technology. And this work was done in collaboration between Maladolin University and Dalarna University in Sweden. And it was founded by, funded, sorry, by the Swedish Research Council for Health, Working Life and Welfare. Welfare technology is considered part of the solution to meet the double demographic challenge of an aging population and fewer people within working age. And technology has the potential to increase quality of life of older persons and persons with disabilities and their relatives, but also to improve the working environment for health and care personnel. And this past decade, we have seen an increase in interest in this welfare technology. 
taking in, into consideration its purpose and it's also its broad user base, welfare technology has been described as all technology that in one way or another improves the lives of those who need it. But the point of departure of this presentation is the somewhat narrower approach by the Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare that defines welfare technology as digital technology that is aimed at maintaining and increasing the safety, activity, participation or independence in a person who has or is at an increased risk of impairment. And this includes, for example, smart homes, technologies for self-care and medication, positioning, telecare and mHealth, uh, but also surveillance systems and assistive computers, for example. The focus of this presentation is on implementation of digital technology for all the persons and persons with disabilities and their informal caregivers, their relatives. That is, I will have a, a user perspective. So this does not include research on technology development or validation of the technology itself. So we have excluded technical reports on welfare technology and studies evaluating the features of the, the devices. But despite the large potential, large-scale implementation of welfare technology has been slow and also narrow in scope. There have been attempts to identify reasons for this slow adoption, but they have been limited to individual studies or expert opinions. There have been some suggestions of barriers such as high costs, lack of competence, lack of knowledge about available solutions, different organizational issues, resistance to change among personnel, weak analysis of needs and technical problems, as well as legal complications. And all the studies addressing these barriers and facilitates of implementation have been published. We haven't been able to find any systematic reviews synthesizing this evidence. This presentation is based on a systematic review of existing research on factors that influence the implementation of welfare technology. And the findings have been categorized into these six themes. There are cap capacity, attitudes and values, ex expectations, health, participation, and identity and lifestyle. And this I will present to you now. The first team, capacity, includes competence, knowledge, and ability among the individual users, their relatives, caregivers, and within health and welfare organizations. Knowledge is about awareness about the technology, as well as knowledge and skills to be able to use it. And this involves having opportunities to practice and to have adjusted information about the products. The user's willingness to learn their, their self-esteem and also their trust in their own abilities will, of course, affect the willingness to learn and adopt the use and use the technology. Sorry. But this means a need for health and welfare organizations to ensure the possibilities for education and practice for the staff as well as the end users and their relatives. And from the individual perspective, it has been recognized that timing is very important, that the technology should be introduced in early stage of illness, for example, in cognitive dysfunctions, to be able for the individual to learn to use the product. Previous experience of technology use and previous ownership will also influence the will to adapt new technology. And this may be both hindering and facilitating. It is easier for those who have and who use technology within their homes to take on new products. The, the experience of products that are familiar and that have worked positively will, of course, affect the adoption of new technology. But if you have experienced malfunctioning devices or products that did, did not meet your needs, then you, you, want, you don't want any new products. 
social economy is another influencing factor. Uh, it was shown that being married or living with a spouse or partner and a higher income predict technology ownership. Implementation where the technology may not fit within an organization's existing systems, and there may be a conflict with established routines and workflows, uh, where it's demanding an integration of technology in the care processes and also new ways of work. In these cases, leadership is a very important capacity for successful implementation, together with clearly expressed roles and also responsibilities. And implementation is always a time demanding process, which also demands sufficient resources. And from a technology perspective, implementation of products in the user's homes is dependent on infrastructure and interacting components, as well as a stable electricity supply. There are recurrent discussions about the safety of networks and the risk of access to data by unauthorized persons. Technology should also be usable for those it's meant for. It should be practical, easy to use, and not demanding advanced knowledge. It has been suggested that it is as important for all the persons to learn about technology, what we call technology literacy, as it is for the developers to learn about aging, aging literacy. And research has also discussed the cost of implementation of technology and who should pay for it. There are several factors related to attitudes and values. Attitudes among individual users, so informal caregivers and personnel affect implementation just as the level of trust in the technology. Attitudes are affected by external influences, such as social networks, but also meetings with care providers and home care staff. Especially the opinions from our family are one important influencing factor for adoption. It may be perceived as either an encouragement to use new, te new technology, or it could be perceived as a pressure. And among personnel within care and social services, there is a perceived pressure to adopt new technology, which is sometimes associated with, the, with a sense of worry and also a sense of threat. One recurrent discussion is about ethics and privacy. This is related to who will be involved in the use of technology and who will access to the data that is gathered, but also related to remote monitoring and the possible perception of surveillance. There is also worry that technology may be deceptive. And this is related to human-like or pet-like technology that may deceive persons, for example, with dementia believing it's real. From an organization perspective, the climate within the organization, together with a shared vision and shared goal setting, is important for successful implementation. And the resistance to change within an organization will become a barrier. In one of the articles, the organizational climate was even perceived to punish creativity. And the organizations are also influenced and dependent on existing laws and policies. There are both expectations and concerns related to the implementation of welfare technology. Technology that is expected to be able to meet needs such as safety or contribute to autonomy in everyday life and that this is expected to be useful and also contribute to social connectedness is also easier to, to assimilate. There is on one hand expectation on technology to contribute to social connections but at the same time, a worry that it instead will contribute to social isolation and loneliness. And from a caregiver perspective, informal and formal, there is a concern for quality of care and the perception that technology will replace human delivered care. 
which will have an impact on the user caregiver relationship. And for personnel, technology is also associated with new ways of work and a possible threat against the profession and the professional identity as they're expected to assume new roles. Health was discussed related to the individual users, which in this case are the older persons and persons with disabilities. Within the included articles, physical and mental health, body function, number of falls, and self-reported general health were factors that influenced the perception of need for technology. For example, it was recognized that previous falls increased the readiness among older persons to use technology within their homes. The theme participation is about involvement of individuals, informal caregivers, and personnel in decisions and planning. This involves consent and the possibility for individuals and their relatives to be able to choose between technology or human delivered care and services. It is also about the possibility to participate in the planning of the care. And for successful implementation, the personnel should be involved in the process from decision, goal setting, and during the intervention. And finally, the identity and lifestyle is about acceptance and fit of technology in the everyday life. Acceptance is discussed in, in the relation to identity of being a technology user. And the process towards acceptance among the individuals may be rather long and also associated with overcoming stigma related to being frail and dependent. Also, adjustment of technology to everyday life is important for the individuals. And placement of the equipment, such as cameras or sensors within the home, is important to consider because if they are visible, they may contribute to sensor surveillance and also contribute to stigma. Uh, and besides visibility, appearance was discussed. It was suggested that the devices should have an appealing design. So when planning for implementation of welfare technology for older persons and persons with disabilities, it is important to consider capacity, attitudes and values, health, expectations, participation, and identity and lifestyle. The technology should be available, it should be safe, usable, and fit the user's daily lives. And implementable welfare technology should focus on needs but also consider design and possible experience stigma related to the identity of being a welfare technology user. So according to these findings, there are several dimensions to take into consideration when implementing welfare technology and the related changes in workflows and routines. A relatively limited part of these factors that was found is about the technology itself. The main part is very much similar to what has been recognized within implementation research. And for example, so-called determinant frameworks with factors that influence implementation of innovations. But I also believe it points at the importance of not just focus on the technology itself, but the change of workflows and routines with that comes with implementation of technology. Welfare technology is one method to meet the needs and increase independence, safety, activity, and participation and quality of life for persons who have or are at risk of impairment. The results from this review may be used as a support when planning and implementation intervention of welfare technology for older persons and persons with disabilities. And if you have any questions, you are welcome to contact me. Thank you very much. And I give the word to Christine. 
Yes, I, thank you, Victor. Oh, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could, could I, could you change back to the slide you had? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> could I, could I put in an, a question a number uh, one to you, Victoria? Yes, of course. Uh, for my, for myself, I think it's very what I see uh, from my perspective. It's very interesting to to see and hear about uh, the the what you were into when it comes to attitudes and values and and about the culture in organizations. I know that uh, the Norwegian Veikart uh, for Tjänst Innovation and, and Roadmap for Service Innovation in the work of Welfare Technology Program program in Norway they have identified this as as crucial in the in the area and they. They uh, say that anchor, they they say that anchoring and insight in the organization is crucial to be to be successful. So um, it's not really a question; it's just an, an, an comment on that. And and I, I I think you agree on that. This is extremely important, and it's just so little about the technology; it's more about the culture. Yes, it's very true. <laughs> And what could we do about that? Working in when when with the culture issues. Well, this is a, a big issue in implementation uh, research, in implementation innovations, uh, interventions. Sorry, uh, yeah. in large, of course, it's very important to to have the whole organization and have everyone that is involved uh, make them participate and being involved in doing the whole process. Of course, and they need to have a need for this uh, in innovation that we're implementing. Yeah, yeah. Victoria, before you leave uh, the presentation <laughs> mode, there are. I would like to ask you three small questions about the study you have been the uh, first author about. Uh, first, I think it would be interested for for the. Uh, attendees to know how many pu publications were included in the study. Uh, this study will uh, result in two publications. Sorry. <laughs> well, the first publication is about these factors that we have found, and, and uh, another publication is about the, the research gaps uh, we have found during this review. Yeah. the need for further research in the area. Yeah, but uh, this study you presented the findings from now, how many uh, articles oh, are included in the, in the review analysis? Yes, sorry, I, I misunderstood your question. Uh, finally, it was 33 uh, studies or articles that was included in this review. Mm -hmm. We started up with about 3,000. And uh, a following question to that is um, briefly, which countries uh, were included uh, in, in the representations uh, of the uh, included studies? Uh, well, it was a mix, a large a number of the included studies were from the United States and from the Netherlands, but there were some other uh, articles from the Nordic countries and I believe from Germany too. Yeah. So it was a mix. Yeah. And uh, the last question to you. From uh, your understanding, what is the correct the character of the included studies? Are there a majority of qualitative or quantitative uh, studies? Well, uh, from these 33 articles, there were 27 that were of qualitative design or used qualitative methods with interviews or, or focus groups. Um, there were none uh, randomized control trial. Uh, there were a couple of mixed methods and, and uh, descriptive methods. Yeah. And I, I think that's quite, um, the, to say, the sit, describing the situation we are, are in the field of health and welfare technology uh, at the moment. And maybe we need to take a new step into uh, uh, trying to find funding for larger studies uh, to be able to, to have um, more data to analyze, maybe in RCT studies. Yes. Yeah. And some of the included articles also requested a more long longer and um, uh, more RCT studies. Yeah. 
Okay. Could I just ask uh, this question, a very short question. Where have you published the article, Victoria? Oh, it's not yet published. It's submitted, so we are waiting for a reply. So All right. soon, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, we will now move on to the panelist discussion uh, based on the presentation we heard. But as Bengt informed you earlier, there is also a possibility to ask questions to all attendees or to the panelists. And uh, I think we will start with a question to the panel and, and then uh, Bengt will add um, uh, qu with questions from the chat. Is that okay with you, Bengt? Yep, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And we have uh, a very nice uh, panel here with the researchers representing the uh, countries uh, which are involved in this uh, health and welfare technology research network. We have Helena Melkas, which you have met earlier in the, in the intro introduction. We have Laila Oxenberg from uh, Copenhagen University Hospital in Denmark. We have Gunhinde Rotwald from uh, Norwegian Center for E-Health Research. And we have uh, Bengt as uh, having the more uh, Nordic overarching perspective. And uh, I'm also a part of the panel and I'm a researcher from Melodon University in Sweden. And as you see in the slide, we have uh, our Found, we are founded in different disciplines, and that, that's one of the strengths of the network that we are um, inter, interdisciplinary in this field. So maybe the panelists could uh, turn on their cameras. Yes. And thank you and welcome to the discussion. And now Gunhilde is here as well. So, the aim of the network is to consolidate and disseminate research-based knowledge and in one way serve the practice of elderly care and disability practice. Um, what are your understanding and comments uh, based on the study Victoria presented? What is the contribution with this kind of research uh, to the practice field of elderly care and, and disability practice. Uh, I can start and uh, ask Laila, what is your comments in this matter? Yes, first of all, thank you. Very, very nice presentation. Um, yeah, I, I think it's very, it, it really shows that it's very important that we sort of do these reviews and to, to condense our knowledge. Um, it's very important that we, we move forward within these fields. And it's very interesting that even though you take literature from various fields, it's actually the same kind of, of issues coming up. And, and it really calls for, for major steps forward when it comes to more research, both when it comes to methodology, but also the way that we, we, we address these uh, yeah, gaps in, in, in knowledge. Um, so, so it really shows that that we we have a a, a, a common cause here that we can we can address. Mm -hmm. And Helena, from a Finnish perspective, and also your discipline's perspective. Well, I would say that um, when we talk about health and welfare technology or welfare technology, as as in this article, um, it's a very wide. Um, issue in the society, really requiring systemic understanding. And it's also something that is uh, related and studied in quite many scientific fields, with even with uh, many different concepts and approaches. So um, it's really, really valuable to have uh, studies that synthesize other studies and then also um, help us in uh, building up this uh, wider understanding together. Mm -hmm. And Gunhilde from a Norwegian perspective. <laughs> yeah, I, thank you for a very nice presentation. And I, I agree with both Laila and uh, Helena. And, um, <clears throat> uh, but I'm a little bit surprised uh, that the findings uh, uh, were 
um, so much in USA and the Netherlands and uh, so few in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, my impression is that uh, uh, the pilot process or the use or the trials within welfare technology in the Nordic countries are uh, has been ongoing for several years. Uh, so, um, but I don't know if uh, the term welfare technology is difficult to, to make search on because it, it's, uh, it's so wide, so to speak, and, and the term is used in a different ways, even within the Nordic countries. Uh, that's one point. And another point is the, the word implementation and the practice. Uh, it's difficult words to make search on. So yeah, I need, we need to, perhaps we need to, to split them and to be uh, even uh, more precise and narrow uh, the questions, the research questions for each, each uh, search. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you kind of, um highlighting one of the, the problems in the field is that the way we use concepts and, and also conceptualize uh, them in, in the research area. And uh, also, again, if we look at the manuscript, there were quite many hits from the start. There were thousands of, of articles and studies, but then um, by working with the inclusion uh, process, it should be about implementation and, and all these limitations we set as inclusion criteria. So, so maybe that's one of the uh, explanation. But then again, when you combine the areas of health and welfare technology, elderly care and disability practice and implementation, it's kind of a narrow the, the area. But we, we, again, there are some knowledge uh, in the area, but then again, if we look at which, what are the aims of using welfare technology, as Victoria said in the end of the presentation, that uh, one of the goals is to, to uh, increase health, to uh, increase independence, uh, to increase uh, security and safety. There are actually uh, not research instruments measuring these uh, values, as we say, should be the goal of, of uh, using the welfare technology. And I think that also um, contributes uh, to the area when we talk about the implementation, that we have problems to, to measure also the, the expected goals of it. But Bengt, if we kind of um, take a view from an overarching Nordic perspective, what are your comments and, and understanding of the, the review study that Victoria presented? Well, I'm just for the for, for first, I'm just so happy that uh, that's this kind of review is done because we've been talking uh, um, on a practical level uh, for uh, several years about that it's uh, 80, 90 percent about other things and just 10, 10, 15 percent about the technology, how difficult it is to, to implement welfare technology and have, have to have these kind of overviews help, help us to see what, what is, where is the, uh, the, the, um, the, the bottlenecks uh, to go, go further. So uh, it's, it's very, very important to have, have these kind of, of overviews done and, and publica publications made to to, to uh, help us go, go further. And that's, it doesn't matter which of the countries we are in, we have the very, very similar problems uh, dealing with this. So it put very good that we highlight this uh, uh, as yeah. this is done. Mm -hmm. But one of the, the main ideas having this Nordic network is that we have similar welfare systems. But then if we look into, for example, the USA, the United Kingdom, Germany, there are uh, different welfare systems. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, when we're looking to the findings, will it have impact on the work with implementation, the welfare systems, the funding for, for this kind of welfare technologies? Today is quite expensive, many of these uh, welfare technologies, devices. Yeah, are you asking me? <laughs> or we, well, I'm asking everyone. <laughs> yes, okay, then someone else can ask. <laughs> Please, if you, if you have any thoughts or comments. 
it's a tricky question, I think. Uh, I, say, I say, no, I don't think really the systems really uh, matters so much here, but of course about the socioeconomic economy and economy and investments, uh, who is going to do the investments? Of course, that's important. In fact, that goes into uh, one of the questions we have got here is that uh, about the legislation and support of use technology. Uh, also, if you're interesting, if you how to compare it with conventional uh, activities. Um, so, so we this sort of we need to prove everything. Uh, that is works with the welfare technology, but uh, the traditional way we're doing it, yeah, we are doing it. So, so uh, yeah, I don't know if that was a, going from your question, but I think that's interesting. And we got a question about that. Uh, how we see about that? Mm -hmm. Question back to you. <laughs> uh, I can please, please. try to comment a little bit on this. Uh, uh, I think in, in the Nordic countries, we are um, similar in the way that we uh, have a lot of the same values. Uh, and Victoria pointed on attitudes and values as one of the areas uh, important for planning the implementation process, one of the areas to take to consider as important. And uh, we in the Nordic countries, we are um, we really focused on the accessibility to uh, to healthcare, uh, independent in where you are living, what kind of um, um, resources you have, and so on. And the inequality in in health uh, is um, something that we really have focus on. And we also adopt this when it comes to e-health and to the health and welfare technologies that. The accessibility should be taken care of uh, also when you are using technology. So the infrastructure part and the, the literacy uh, and all that things that could hinder people uh, access to health service uh, because of use of the technology will be very important for us to, to uh, consider when we are implementing. I don't know if this is specific for the Nordic countries, but it's obviously very important for us to make sure that technology doesn't uh, make the service um, uh, harder to access or poorer quality for the service. True. Yes, Laila. Yeah, I agree that, that I think we do have some advantages when we look at uh, our Nordic countries as a unity within this field, because we do have similar systems for supporting. And, and if you look at this review, it's not, not just the personal circumstances that defines whether you're going to be a user of health and welfare technology. It's also the system surrounding you and the, the professionals surrounding you. And I think when you build technology, you also have to think of the system that it's going to be used in. So I think that being similar, yes, we can perhaps um, do some better business cases going from pilot studies to, to uh, actual studies and then to, to, to real products being out on the market. We can, we can if we join together, we can, uh, we can have more power within this kind of development of, of, of technology and development of evidence-based technology uh, yeah. in the future. So I think definitely, yes, we should we should join up uh, for some between Nordic um, research projects also and development development projects. Yeah. Yes, Helena. Yes, thank you. I agree with uh, Laila. I think it's quite important to uh, focus on the Nordic countries as also as one um, unity because. Um, in a, when you think about the global uh, perspective, the Nordic systems are so uh, so different and so unique, and um, they have a very different history uh, from those of the other countries. They have a very different uh, comprehensiveness or, or let's say breadth uh, than those of the other countries. And uh, we also have this, um, let's say, uh, aim of um, bringing social care and health care closer to each other. And in general, we have more social care than, in, than, than other countries. 
globally have. So these kinds of issues make it important to um, also know this context very well and not sort of uncritically take lessons learned from, uh, from countries with completely different welfare systems. That's true. And, and um, another aspect of that is also maybe cultural similarities um, about this to the very high cultural value to be independent uh, in, in the society. Um, and that's one of the goal with using health and welfare to, to technology to stay independent uh, and in your own home, like in the policy of aging in place, for example. Bang, do we have a, a question from the chat? Maybe we should uh, highlight in, in the panel discussion. Yeah, I have a, a question here. Uh, uh, is if there are areas uh, that you see, I think it's it's connected to 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 Victoria's presentation. If the areas we see that there is a lack of research. Well, I, I could start with, with one view of this that uh, actually I would say there are not so much evidence, uh, research-based evidence of the effects of welfare technology. Uh, if you look, look into measurements of uh, the goals we want to reach by using health and welfare technology. So that's, that's one aspect. And one way to start with that is to uh, um, develop a validated instrument to measure the values we want to reach uh, with wealth, health and welfare technology. Mm. Any other comments, Laila? Yeah, I agree with you with that being, being a, an issue we have to address, but also when we actually look at this um, uh, review, uh, it could be interesting to look more into what are actual e examples of successful implementation and, and, and find out where, where to go and, and do more of that. Um, actually, also, when we, when we talk about uh, research and, and publications and so on, I could also, sometimes I, I'm wondering whether we also have a, a um, publication bias within this field that people are not that keen to present, perhaps not uh, very successful projects uh, and so and if we don't do that we don't get to look into the the, the all the, the 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 difficult issues that we need to address we 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 definitely have to look at our success but we also need to address when are we not successful with implementation and and looking into the details of that so i think we have to address yeah, implementation from a very broad perspective when it comes to re comes to research. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Gunil, do you have uh, your hand raised there? So well? yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, add uh, something when it comes to the uh, transition from the pilot phase of the uh, implementation process to the scale up and the large uh, scale of phase. And uh, I think there are some interesting uh, research uh, done in England uh, showing that there are uh, factors uh, that influences the ability to scale up. As uh, Victoria had the Tisha Greenhalgh uh, referenced in her um, uh, description, uh, I know. and. Uh, uh, there are also other researchers uh, who have studied this uh, Dallas program in England. I think it was in 2016. Uh, and they have very interesting uh, findings when it comes to uh, the role of the champions. And the champions uh, in, in Norway, for instance, we have a lot of protests going on. And, uh, but we, uh, there's a challenge to, to, uh, to make the transition from the pro project into the scale up phase. And uh, within the project phase, the, the champions has a very important role. And uh, the article I read uh, from England um, pointed on the same thing. But 
as you scale up and as you manage to scale up and implement, this is an ordinary part of the service, the role of the champions decrease, the importance of their role decrease. And it seems like uh, it's a natural development. <laughs> uh, looking into the projects that are running, I think still, if, uh, at least in Norway, all champions that are involved are really important at the stage of all the projects uh, today. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, my point is that if the champions are very important, then um, the project is not mature enough to be implemented in the organization. Yeah. And from a Swedish perspective, we also have this organizational view the, the municipalities self-governance in Sweden. In Sweden, there are 290 municipalities and they are self-governing. And, and I have experienced that sometimes every single municipality have to conduct their own um, evaluation of different welfare technology. So from a Swedish perspective, we kind of miss the national guidance, the policy or the national knowledge center to support the, the municipalities who are responsible of the social care, disability practice and elderly care uh, in Sweden. So we kind of living with the issue that everybody has to invent the wheel 290 times uh, to, to have these large scale implementations. I saw that Helena raised the hand. Yes, um, we. I, I recognize that situation from Finland too, that you described, Christine. Um, I was delighted to see this word implementation in the title in and, and in general in Victoria's um, and your study, because I think that um, simply the words, the choice of the word also is important. Uh, because implementation refers to a process, a long, longer term process and longer term use. So uh, pilots are important, but they are not enough. So this is really, um, really vital to focus on the implementation. And returning to this question of what kind of um, studies would be needed um, on the basis of this, this um, study that we heard about, um, I think that also, for instance, the perspective of informal caregivers and also people with disabilities, they have been uh, highlighted much less than uh, elderly, older people's views and, and needs and uh, experiences. So in general, those two groups of people also would, would uh, deserve to be focused on in greater detail. Mm. That's true. Um, as I was referring to the, the one of the questions which were raised before that um, there might be some bias in, in the existing research. And, and one of them is uh, what I have experienced. There is a, some kind of welfare technology optimism. <laughs> if we look into the studies, um, I would say there is a majority of studies where the participants in the study are people who chose to use welfare technology. We don't know so much about the, the groups of people who didn't choose or don't know about the existence of welfare technology as well. So that's also an area we need to explore. And I can see there's a question in the chat from Helene von Granitz who asking, uh, who will be disadvantaged uh, with the development of welfare technology? Who are the losers in, in, in this field uh, of development of elderly care and disability practice? Yes, please, Laila. Yeah, I don't know if there are any losers, but we need to be able to support everyone who would like to use and have a need of this kind of technology. And it should also be, um, uh, it should also be allowed to not, not choose 
technology. So I think that's the, the balance that we need to have. Also, when you talk about um, the, the optimism around uh, technology and technology use, I, I definitely definitely agree that we have to address all the, the, the things that are problematic and, and, and see how many can we help if they would like to use technology, how, how good implementation can we actually do to support them? And, and how can we support the people who would not like to use technology? Uh, it should be an option and not an, 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 an yeah, be an option and not something that you should do just because you are a fragile uh, person who needs help. Uh, it should be optional with what kind of help you would like to have. Um, yeah. So now I have another comment, but I'll just save that for later. Yes, Helena. Yes, this actually what Laila said brings to my mind the concept of informed choices. So that's something that we should be able to, um, to um, encourage and support that uh, informed choices would take place at all levels, the societal level more generally speaking about implementation of welfare technology, also at the organizational level that, the, that each organization would have sufficient knowledge and sufficient um, sort of foundation for making these informed choices for them, appropriate for them, and then also at the individual level, uh, the end users. Yeah, and uh, Helena, we, we have discussed this before in, in another project, the uh, Orient project, that um, the, some of the participants, uh, especially the, the older people who were our uh, informants, they said it's, it's hard to ask for something you don't know exists. So we also have an ori orientation uh, issue to work with to inform uh, the society or potential use of what is available in in words of welfare technology or digital support in in daily life so so literacy is is an important area to work uh, with yes and i completely agree of course with this importance of orientation but it's uh, something that should be uh, first of all, uh, identified as a key activity with regard to using welfare technology and its various types. And uh, there are really great knowledge needs. We have found that in our studies over the years that, for instance, these informal caregivers, they have really, really great knowledge needs. There is no, usually no neutral and easily um, available information uh, around so that they could have have learn more and and be able to make these informed choices yeah and I, and i also think as an uh, assignment for maybe academia or or different professionals to to work also with the ethical aspects of using welfare technology are there ethical problems we need to consider and also respect when we discuss uh, the implementation of welfare technology, there are rules and legislations who are uh, supporting us in our work and also uh, implementation work, but there are also more um, ethical uh, aspects we also need to consider um, when we're talking about, for example, uh, informed consent uh, to use uh, welfare technology. Again, for example, in dementia care, when it might be a problem to have uh, an, an, what should I say, ordinary um, yes or no, <laughs> I would like to use it. And, and that's an also, I, I know it has been on a governmental level about these uh, future contracts that you, um, <laughs> maybe before you develop some kind of dementia disease or condition, you, you kind of give your uh, approval to use welfare technology in, as a support in your daily life. Has that been uh, an issue in, in Finland, Norway and Denmark? Uh, talking about these ethical issues, for, uh, for example, when you have a condition when it might be hard to, to have the full uh, approval. Um. 
Yes, uh, it has uh, not only for welfare technology, but in, in many uh, other um, areas uh, which are important when you are in a stage uh, not uh, able to take care of yourself and not able to um, take good decisions by yourself. There's an ongoing debate all the time, I guess, uh, on this. But within welfare technology, I think um, this has been mainly when it comes to use of the GPS uh, in the dementia care. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. How is it in Denmark? Is this an ongoing discussion? Well, it is a discussion that it could be even even the addressed even more but uh, when it comes to sort of what we call safety technology and uh, yeah gps as well we have a new legislation in denmark that gives um, caretakers some options if if the, the person with dementia is not able to to give their consent to it uh, so but i'm not an expert in that but but i know there's a new legislation that that uh, moves this field forward because sometimes it's also a matter of 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 the best intent and uh, the ability to to actually help people in the best possible way through health and welfare technology, but yeah, it is a difficult uh, discussion. But uh, but and that's also another issue that that this there's all the the, the ethical issues, but that also the the legislative uh, issues that we need it needs to sort of. Um, be at the same level as the development of technology, and I think that we could actually address that discussion even more also and and learn from each other in in the nordic countries also how to how to address these issues mm. how about uh, in finland helena well yes it's a discussion in finland too and it uh, certainly could be focused even more um i would actually highlight this this proactiveness that is in the name of our or is focused on in, in this project that I briefly uh, introduced. So um, proactiveness in the sense that people would be uh, would be able to start using welfare te technology early on, and not at a stage that is uh, when they are already too frail. Mm -hmm. That's true. Bang, is this uh, an issue that is discussed on the Nordic Welfare Center level? Absolutely, we have a network with uh, uh, a Nordic network for for dementia and cognitive. Uh, so, so uh, absolutely, we discuss that and we discuss that together with uh, with uh, the senior advisor and the networks that work with that uh, combined with welfare technology. So we follow that closely. What happens on all levels in in in, in every country? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Do we have a question from the chat? Maybe. Yeah, I have questions and I have comments. <laughs> no well, comments from myself. Maybe, no, I yeah. just want to comment. I just want to comment. You said this. I go back to what you said about the municipalities in Sweden and municipalities everywhere. I think they want to invent their own wheel. I see from a Nordic perspective the same thing. I have seen that there are pilot projects going on in, in, in one country and then they say we don't have any research on this area, but there is a research from a neighboring country and then they say oh that's from that country we, we don't trust that. Uh, so we really are with this network we also want to, to make it a, everything that comes from Nordic countries could be used for sort of proving that you should go on working with what you're working with, even if it's not from your own researchers in your own country. So that's our one of the really target uh, main, main, main goals for, for us at the Nordic Welfare Center to, to highlight this. Uh, I go to, uh, def to another question. Let's go back to Helena that uh, asked about uh, if there are any ones that are, will be disadvantaged. You, uh, she also added if uh, not only users but also providers or I understand it as the people working with this and and would add again that this network is not is for all all users of welfare technology is for the end users but also for for the staff the professionals working in this area and I would just like to add that we have been looking into that in a project we're working not the research project just to see if the distance spanning solutions or digital solutions or welfare technology sort of have an impact on recruitment and comp, uh, comp, competence provision. 
And what we come up with, with there, we will publish a report here in March is that the, 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 the most positive thing is the, 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 um, the environment of work, their work situation are more positive. And we have done interviews in Exota in Finland and North Jylland, Denmark and Songefjord and Norway. And, and we, when you ask these, the people working, we say, if we want to go back to how they used to work, they say, and there's no one that says yes, everyone think that this is a national development of using the digitalization or technology of today. So, uh, but I think there is a lack of research in this area when it comes to, to uh, providers and, and staff. And when talking about Exot, uh, we have Pente Itkana with us and he puts a question, uh, uh, all countries are adding nurses and practical nurses and staff in general, at the same time, we're adding investments in new technology. How long our system can stand this kind of development and when can we see result of research work on operational level? Difficult question. We have parallel development here, so to speak. <laughs> Laila. Yes, Laila. Yeah, well, maybe that's just one perspective. Maybe it's not the opposite because maybe technology don't always have to replace human resources. Uh, maybe adding things up, you can just make even better quality of life for these people who need this kind of care and help. But yeah, I know there's also an issue of, of, of have we got the resources, but we do have an issue, very, very strong uh, issue coming up with not having enough people to take care of elderly and, and disabled in the society. So, so maybe we have to keep on doing this for a while until we can see, well, where can we actually have technology replace human resources in a sensible and, 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 and user-friendly way. Um, so yeah, that was my view on that. Yeah. And I have a similar comment on that, that we are facing a, a serious staff uh, problem. Uh, in in all Nordic countries, I will say that, and uh, to be able to to have the human resources for the patients or the uh, older people or people with disability who really needs the human care, we need to locate the, that kind of care to these pe persons. And where it's ethical and possible, I think we should replace someone with something. <laughs> Actually, I saw Helena. I, I, I'm sorry, I interrupted your. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, well, um, I think that the key issue, in addition to implementing well whatever is taken into use, whatever technology is taken into use, a key issue is also to really depart from needs. What are the the precise needs? Uh, for the precise care tasks in different kinds of services, because we're talking about a very wide sphere of uh, social and healthcare services and even other services actually. So uh, there are many different types of services with many different types of tasks. And what are the needs? And what, uh, so this, this needs uh, base basis is, is really, vital also when we think, think about these investments and the funding, difficult funding questions. And I think one of the, the questions to work with, if, we, if we're looking into the um, growing group of people, older people, I think one of the key factors to work with is prolonged independent life, to stay independent as long as you can. If we could move that year when you kind of enter the social care a couple of years and push it forward a couple of years there are many benefits for all parts of this uh, area because uh, i think it's a, a very uh, common um, attitude that you want to stay independent if you could and uh, i would say that the majority would say that if I could have the choice between staying independent or need support and help by, by social care or maybe also my, my relatives or friends, I prefer to have the technology that makes me independent. Uh, 
Uh, can I just add something, Christina? Yes, uh, please. I also think that uh, technology will develop and uh, we will have um, better interoperability uh, and more, the technology will be more like seamless and uh, um, yeah, the interaction between different kinds of te technologies will be improved. And this will also improve the workflow, I guess, and the work process for healthcare personnel. And some of the benefits uh, from the technology, I think, is in the information flow and in the work, and the workflow can improve. Uh, and that we will hopefully maintain uh, to give patients uh, the necessary um, uh, attention that they need to have uh, independent of the technology. I have yes. two questions here. I, I don't know, or should Helena say, yeah, you vibe. Uh, yes, I was actually going to uh... If I may uh, answer to this question, oh, yeah. <laughs> to me, <laughs> so um, uh, that the um, the people with disabilities and also the informal uh, caregivers are less emphasized in uh, uh, health and welfare technology research. Uh, no, I don't have a single literature refer reference to that proving that, but it's uh, based on my my. Uh, field uh, experience in, in this field. Yeah. Yes. But Gunhild, uh, am I wrong if I recall that you have conducted some kind of review of uh, health and welfare technology research in the area of disability practice? No, you're not wrong. We have done, uh, actually a colleague of mine, Undine Knarvik and me did uh, and uh, together with Marianne Tromsen, we did a literature review, not a systematic review, but we did a more like a scoping review, I guess. And uh, we identified a lot of articles uh, ended up with, I don't remember the exact number now, but I think it was about 30 articles we, we went through, read the uh, text and um, there are a lot of um, research within some areas of uh, welfare technology when it comes to, to children and adolescents with disabilities, with cognitive disabilities. And uh, I, we don't, we only have this article in, or report, we didn't uh, write an article, we have a report written in Norwegian. <laughs> uh, but this brings me to, to the next seminar and maybe Bengt will say something about it because the next seminar will actually focus this topic. And yeah, it was, it was a very it, nice bridge. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have just one. I have just one question that we missed in the beginning. I think there's just one question in the chat that we have that uh, uh, highlighted. Hello, I'm starting my thesis related to walking robotics with neurological patients. I'm only a very in, in, I'm only a very preliminary stage. I'm a partially interested in experiences and perceptions of the neuro, neuro, neurological patients. Do you know where any patients' experiences of walking robotics have studied? I don't know so much about well, that. Yeah, I think Helena might know something about that field. <laughs> Well, actually, well, perhaps it's um, it's an occupational disease kind of that I don't remember many <laughs> details. So I know that there is research, but I cannot give any references directly. Yeah, but maybe the the use of the word exoskeletons might might be useful in in that area. Yeah. This kind yes, of um, robotic trousers <laughs> you you put on, yeah. yeah, and also brand names like uh, Lokomat. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I ruined your very nice <laughs> left there, Gunhilde. But <laughs> so what yeah. do you say, Christine? Are we, yeah. uh, we maybe could, we, we could, could sit could, uh, here and discuss here for, for a couple of hours, but uh, I don't think we we're, we're the time is running running and uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's time to kind of uh, closing this discussion and and thank you very much for all this interesting the interesting question that has been uh, addressed in the chat. 
and also thank you very much to the panelists who has shared their experiences and, and insights and knowledge in the area. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the aim of the uh, Health and Welfare Technology Research Network to kind of consolidate our knowledge and research in the area. But we also have an assignment or task to try to disseminate this knowledge to the the field of elderly care and disability practice. And, and this might be a challenge, but we will try to work with that in, in, um, with our channels and also with support from the Nordic Welfare Center. Oh. So thank you very much for this. And now I'll leave the floor for Bengt. Yeah, and, and Gunnille, you can hang on. So you could, you could comment uh, on what you're going, going to be up to uh, the next time. And I will share my screen here. Yeah, uh, say the date for the next webinar is on in one month, 18th of uh, March at the same time, one o'clock to half past two. Uh, we will have a webinar called Health and Welfare Technology for Children and Young Adults with Disabilities. And uh, Gunhilde, the, we will listen to two presentations. Yeah, we, uh, we will um, plan for two presentations uh, and uh, we are not sure if we would like to, how we will uh, build this um, uh, seminar, if we are going to have presentations after each and discussion after each presentations. We need to, to think a little bit more about it, but uh, we will have two different kind of focus. Uh, very interesting. One of them is um, a user-centered approach um, we are going to present um, research that has been done at the Norwegian Center for eHealth Research for five years, following some municipalities in Norway mm -hmm. in their implementation, early implementation process uh, of uh, different kinds of uh, health and welfare technology to children and adolescents with cognitive disabilities. Uh, Indina Knarvik will be the main presenter. Uh, and uh, the other presentation uh, is focusing more on the user-driven innovation and the design process and how they have involved um, young adults in the design process of um, designing technology for, for this target group. Mm -hmm. And this presentation, presentation will be done by uh, Krista Fari from the University of Agder. So I think we will have two interesting presentations focusing on a very vulnerable group of users that are not often in scope in this kind of discussion. That sounds very good. I'm looking forward to it. And I hope you're all uh, looking forward to it as well and can come with us on the 18th of March. We will send you information about this, then you could sign up and but say the date already now. And um, okay, uh, that was all for now. I thank you all for a very for a very con nice contribution and chat and on the, all the panelists. And uh, see you again on the 18th of March. Thank you. Bye.